Welcome to CJ's Chat Box. My name is CJ Sorensen, and I have a show on TV6 where I interview people from the village who have tremendously interesting lives. They have stories to tell, and I think everybody should hear them. So, welcome to my show. Today I have Armand Fizzer, otherwise known as Dutch Fizz. So tell me a little bit about, I found out that you are uh, from a foreign land. Yeah, I was, I was born in, on Java, which is an island north of Australia. And when I was one, my parents moved to Holland because the colonies down there became independent. And mm. so we could either stay there or go back to Holland. And so we went back to Holland. Huh. And so what was your dad doing that he was in Java? He was working for the government. He was a, okay. uh, a, uh, what do you call, a warden of a prison. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Tough job. Yeah. So you were like two by the time you got to Holland and? No, I was actually one. Just, just one. A little, just yeah, little guy. He left at one, yeah. Yeah. So did you, um, have brothers and sisters or were you oh, the yeah, baby? I was, I was the youngest of seven. Wow. So yeah, I had one sister and a whole s bunch of brothers. Right. So. Grew up having a lot of fun, I bet. Yeah, yeah, I had, I had. Uh, Playing with them. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting because uh, of course I grew up in Holland, so that was totally different, different sort of lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, growing up in Holland, of course, and going to school there, was it primarily that you spoke Dutch, or did they teach you all kinds of languages? Well, you know, grade school was all in Dutch, uh -huh. and then as I as I got out of grade school, then they, we had to learn French and and uh, English, and German I learned in high school here. So. Okay, I've heard that it's easier to learn a foreign language if you do it when you're young. That yeah, it's yeah. easier to do that. Yeah, I've been trying to learn Spanish forever. I haven't <laughs> succeeded yet. <laughs> well, you, you keep trying, though, yeah. but that's it. Yeah. So um, I think you said that you, some, and I don't remember how someone either started you with a guitar or you found one, or how did you get yeah, started? My, my mom bought us a guitar when we were, uh, when I was six. Wow. Between the three younger brothers that were still at home, the other ones had already moved out so there was mm -hmm. the three younger and so my mom taught us a few chords and then said well just listen to the radio and pick up some songs and that's how we got going so did you play together as a group then the three no, brothers no no we, we only had one guitar oh i see you so, had to take yeah. turns <laughs> yeah we take turns and we yeah. taught each other chords mm -hmm. and songs and stuff like mm -hmm. that yeah. yeah what type of artists did you listen to when you were young like that back then it was like stuff out of the 40s and don't Asked me, like, All of Me was one of them that oh, was okay. still, you know, uh -huh. prominent. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and then later on, as we got a little better, then we started listening to, in Holland, there's pirate stations, uh, oh. radio stations that are out in the, uh, in the sea. Uh -huh. Like, they're on boats, so they couldn't, you know, mandate what, what they <gasps> could what play, they what they couldn't play. They were outside the territorial uh -huh. water restrictions, so... What did you listen to from those pirate stations? Well, we listened to, you know, they, of course, they were always, always more cool than the, than the government-operated yeah. stations. And also there was a, uh, uh, stations in England they would listen to. Okay. So, uh, so any particular artists there that you emulated at all? or? Uh, well, back then, there was, first of all, was Elvis Presley. Oh, of course. Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry. Oh, yes. And then, you know, came the Kings, the Rolling Stones, mm. the Beatles, the, you know, the whole uh, Progo Harm. <gasps> so, many, many. Yeah. One of the things that I find interesting with the bands that um, play here in the village is that I still don't hear enough Chuck Berry, I don't think. Uh, he oh. was such a rocker that um, influenced, and I found it interesting that even Buddy Holly influenced, uh, was more of an influence in the UK as well as Chuck Berry than they were in the States. So mm -hmm. it was kind of slow for the States to come around. You know, a lot, of, a lot of bands got there, like Jimi Hendrix, for instance. Uh, he got his start in England, in the UK. See, you know. And it's amazing. You know, I loved Jimi Hendrix when he first mm -hmm. came out. He was yeah. very unique and very, 
Definitely he was unique. Wild. He, he was like, wild. He looked like a wild man that escaped from, <laughs> the, from bushland or something. Yes, he did. Yeah. He was quite unique. Also, I think you said that um, you at 14, was that when you did your first gig? Yeah, I did. Yeah, we lived above a bar. We lived in, in Rotterdam, so it was big cities like living in New York, New York okay. City. Okay. Uh -huh. So, uh, and so we were three stories up and below us was a bar. And I went in there one day and I said, hey, why don't you have me play here? And they said, sure, come on, bring your guitar and play the song. Uh -huh. So I came in there, played a couple of tunes and they liked it. So, okay, they gave me some tip and I went off and, mm -hmm. and then I, st I started the band. Um, and so we rehearsed for about a year or so and then we needed a place to go play. Uh -huh. And so I went back to the same place and I said, hey, I have a band now. Do you, do you mm -hmm. want me to play for? And I forgot what the event was, uh -huh. some, some, some holiday. Okay. And they said, sure, you know, and so. What did you call your first band? You know, I can't remember. Oh. <laughs> Where did you find, you know, just friends of yours that you gathered up? Or? Yeah, yeah, I had, I had uh, this kid at school that he, he played drums. Uh -huh. And then he knew some other people that mm. were other guitar players and bass players. And it so does. It doesn't take long to find other musicians. Absolutely. I found that out. Yeah, found yeah. that out. So, and I know that your your parents pa passed away early. You were yeah, quite young. Yeah, my parents passed away when I was thirteen. Okay. So. Um, so did the brothers that were older then kind of? Yeah, one of my brothers became my guardian. Okay. And so you know we stayed in the house and. Uh, Right. That we lived in. and uh, Were you a good student because you didn't have that, uh, you know, if you were... I was, yeah, yeah, I was. I was, well, I was interested in technology. Ah. So, I mean, it was my passion, you know, along with music. And so I was really, you know, turned on by all the technological stuff. And, uh -huh. yeah. and one of the things, I know that you made a trip to the U.S. because you had sisters here or something? Yeah, my, my three older siblings lived here. Okay. So uh, in Orange County. Yeah. So wow. After my parents died, they asked if I wanted to come to the U.S. and and go to school. Mm -hmm. And I said, Sure, sure, anytime. Yeah. It was a hard thing because it was hard to leave my king and country and all my friends and all that yeah. stuff. But it was a good move. Definitely. How many years did you go to school here then? I went to school a total of four years. Okay. So is this in Anaheim? It was high school. Yeah. Where you went? Loera High School. Loera. Yeah. yeah. My son used to play baseball against them, oh, okay. so I know about where that's at. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned, and I don't know if, the, do you go back to Holland? Because you said something about they have different tech training in a, in a you don't have to like, you can go at an earlier age or something, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, right out of grade school, which is sixth grade. Wow. You that's sort of choose to, where do you want to be? Do you want to be a banker, a lawyer, or whatever? And... Uh, I choose to be a technical guy yeah. and work with my hands and yeah, but look at it. So to me, that makes so much sense because you're so young that you pay attention, you can focus, you don't have a lot of distractions. But also, if indeed, as you said, that was kind of your passion at that time, for you to to know that at that young age is some a miracle in itself. But so you're training all the way along because later on in life, I know that you did mm -hmm. uh, become an engineer right. and worked at that. So, so after you came here to the States and went to high school, did you stay here after that? I, did you go back to Holland or I Germany? went, okay, after my four years, I was here on the student visa. That's the only oh, way they okay. could keep me here. Yeah. And so, so I went to school, and as long as I went to school, I could stay. Okay. And, but then when I went to college, they said, now, wait a second, you're a foreign student. And back oh. then, college, junior colleges were free in, or yeah. in uh, California. Uh -huh. Of course, I tried it, you know, for yeah. a period of time. But, you know, having to work and to pay for tuition wasn't yes. very easy. So. Right, right. So then you went back? Yeah, I went back to, I went back to, to Holland, but it, it was so small. I just couldn't live in that environment that mm -hmm. was so... Uh, restricted and so uh, yeah so I went to Germany and I got a, a job with the US Air Force there oh so I worked for for the US Air Force for uh, as a civilian uh-huh was it still in the technical field oh, yeah, yeah I was a radar technician oh wow yeah how that's got to be 
really interesting. Oh, yeah. um, and you know what I always, what I was amazed at, because I know nothing, I always thought of musicians and music and musical art, you know, artists, is that they're so avant-garde, they just, yeah, let's just do this and whatever, and just, let's play that. Well, I, I found out musicians are very, very specific, and they can hear, so that engineers are great musicians because mm -hmm. they make that detail is very, very important. So it isn't just, ah, yeah, you know, there's, they hear, they make sure that they're playing it exactly as it should be played. So I find that that engineer goes well with all that. Mm -hmm. Or the way they want to play. Yeah, yeah. You know, but it's still specific, I understand. Yes. Pilots are like that, too. Ah, you know. yeah, well, that's another thing that you went into. Yeah. But not till you came, how long were you in Germany then? I was in Germany four years, and then I decided I wanted to, well, then I, I got married to a French woman. So I lived in France for a year and a half okay. before we split up. And then uh, I came back to the U.S. I decided uh, I had enough of Europe. Okay. I wanted to be someplace where things are easier. And, uh -huh. and that's when you were in the uh, Oregon or Seattle area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, well, actually, I met this, while I was in the south of France, I met this girl who was there on a... Uh, as an exchange program okay. thing and she was going to college and so I was about to immigrate and had my papers already mm -hmm. and she said well in case of instead of going to uh, I was going to come to California she said why don't you come to Oregon and meet my parents so I said yeah I could do that and so I changed my flight and and I lived up in Oregon for the last 34 years well, no, yeah, 34 years after living here for six years. Uh -huh. So it's been like a long time ago, yeah. But, and then the, that didn't work out with the girl, right? But just stayed in Oregon no. anyway. Yeah, well, we, she still had to finish her last year in college. I see. So we came to California, lived here for a year. Then we went back to Oregon and yeah. lived there and got married, got divorced. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know how that goes. Yeah, yeah. But th it was while you were in Oregon that you worked as an industrial engineer, yeah, right? Yeah. And then also, is that when you started uh, piloting? And yeah, I sort of got tired of being in in the industry, and I so I decided to to become a flight instructor. Oh. And so I did that for as a, uh, for a number of years. Uh -huh. Also, uh, you know, part time as well as full time because I took a sabbatical. So I did. I wanted to see what it was like to just be a flight instructor, uh -huh. and so I did that for a year. And it, uh, then I went back to uh, to my job uh -huh. basically. And uh, it, it appears that because of the different places, that, you know, whether it was in Germany or here, Oregon, whatever, is that once you have that background of an industrial engineer, it isn't really that difficult to find work. No, you can pretty much, like I said, I lived in Germany, I lived in France. It's like you just go there and just mm -hmm. present yourself. Hmm. I get, it's almost like a musician. You it's like being a bartender. I mean, yeah, if you, you bartend in one place, you can go some exactly. another country and do the same thing. Right, exactly. Oh, that's interesting too. So yeah. how? But then you ended up buying a plane, did you not? Yeah, I, yeah. I had my own plane at the, that I leased back to the school. So. Oh, so did your plane? So therefore, it was still only used for training, yeah, flight training. Yeah, yeah. So it was never where passengers would. You know, you no, take. no, no, no. Okay. It was it was a small trainer. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. It was a four seater. Yeah. And then you know people flew all over the place with it. Like I, I used to take my students to California. We flew into Catalina Island. And, oh, you nice. Know, they had to do their long, long distance cross country flights. Yeah. That's what we did. Oh, for nice. That yeah. was nice. Uh, and uh, and again a diversity. Because you were still working your day job then or whatever with, with yeah, engineering? Yeah, off and on. Like I said, mm. I took a sabbatical of a, mm. a year. So I was, during that time, I was probably full-time uh, flight, flight instructor. Yeah. Well, I know you said that it was quite a long time after the second divorce because you didn't even really have time to meet someone or have a family because you were really busy with the flights and right, yeah. training and all of that kind uh -huh. of thing. And then that kind of came to a stop after 9-11? Yeah, or? after 9-11, you know, they put a bu bunch of restrictions on 
on uh, general aviation and mm. so my my commercial insurance went from 2000 to 6000 wow that's and a jump like, oh yeah it's like and it was you know it was just not worth it anymore ah so i i sold the plane sold the, the plane business, yeah when you were in oregon and um, either while you still married or after you married did you do any gigs there oh yeah i did yeah i um I used to play in a Hawaiian band. On really? The Did you yeah. wear a luau? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. We were, <laughs> you know, we had the girls dancing. And oh, all for heaven's sakes. So, yeah. yeah. Did you play a ukulele? No, no. I played the bass and the guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Have you all, is bass your first choice? Um, well, I started playing bass when I was about 12. After, after I learned to play a few things on the guitar, uh -huh. I got interested in playing bass. So I've been playing bass for a long time, yeah. same as the guitar. Yeah. But, again, you can play the lead because you filled in for us, and I was uh -huh. so pleased that you could. Uh, and you did a heck of a job. You were making her sing. Um, but so there f you can play both, but your preference is playing bass. Well, it's easier for me. I I've have more of a, a, uh, a calling on the bass. Okay. I'm not quite sure what it is. You know, it took me years to, to learn the guitar, but the bass almost came naturally. Mm. From the time I was 14, I, yeah. I could play along in most bands, uh -huh. no problem. And that, so that seemed to fit. And again, you were self-taught, more or less? Yeah. Well, of course, I listened to, to mm -hmm. music. And then right, I, right. I, I tried but you to could pick it up. It, yeah. yeah. So when you were playing gigs in, say, Oregon and playing in a Hawaiian band, but did you then get interested in other musicians and kind of pick up their style or...? Yeah. When you were in the States? Yeah. Um, so when I was up in Oregon, we, you know, as, we, as I progressed in my, in my years of playing music, I uh, started playing for Elks Lodges and, uh, oh. and Eagles and, and those places. Uh -huh. So I wasn't just playing Hawaiian. I was playing rock and roll and, you know, Mustang Sally and, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the, the brown-eyed girls and oh, yes. things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, was it once you got established there in the neighborhood or wherever you lived and were working, was it uh, just as easy to get a hold of musicians to get together? And did you prefer just filling in for people or did you want to start another band? No, I had, I had my band and I filled in with other people too. It's so like, what I did was I just put an ad in the paper. Oh. And, uh, and then, you know, people called me and I mm -hmm. interviewed them and, uh, you know, if I like what they sounded like, then uh -huh. we got together and... Uh, if you all grooved together, then yeah, it was yeah. going to work. Exactly. How, um, what did you call that band, do you recall? Um, no, I really don't. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was a band called Silo, and we were sort of a blues boogie-woogie oh. sort of a thing, like CZ Top. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, that's another thing you don't hear much anymore is the boogie woogie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's if uh, you well, there, there's still quite a lot of it around. I, I before COVID hit, I used to go to blues jams. Oh, where are they locally? Well, there used to be a place down on uh, El Toro and Merlin called Basco's. Oh. And there was a place in Huntington Beach where I went, and there was a place in La Mirada or yeah. Yeah, La Mirada. That's a drive. Yeah. So, and a lot of people travel all over the place to, mm -hmm. to come to these blues jams. Oh, that sounds so fun. And that's the only type of music where people can actually come together, are totally strange to one another, and still can play together. Oh. Because the, the blues, it's, it's like a round going progression that repeats over and over and over. Uh huh. So once you know the progression, then you could mm -hmm. sit in with any blues band and play blues. Yeah, well, like B.B. King and Muddy Waters and, you know, all of those yeah, uh, exactly. great, greats. Eric Clapton, mm -hmm. Jeff mm -hmm. Beck. There's just so many. Um, and that, is that more, do you prefer the blues to rock and roll? No, I, I really don't. I like playing songs. Oh, okay. You know, like I, I used to sit in with country bands up north too. Oh, wow. You are very versatile, dear. Yeah. I always like be in variety. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't like to be stuck in one little corner yeah. playing blues or whatever. Yeah. Did you go to uh, when you were in Holland, still and you know, still a young fella? 
Um, did you go to concerts there, and what kind of concerts did they yeah, offer? Yeah, the, it was just the beginning of the concert scene. Mm. You know, like I saw um, some bands from England, mm. and I can't really recall who they it were. wasn't the Beatles then, I'm no, sure. No, it wasn't the Beatles. No, <laughs> you would have remembered. There was a lot of local, you know, mm -hmm. parties and, you know, music in the park, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. Were they expensive? When they started, was it really an expensive thing? Because right now, concerts are so expensive. That no, it was, it was, you know, affordable. It was pretty cheap, yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, when I, after I moved to California while I was going to high school, I used to remember getting general admission tickets to Disneyland. We weren't old enough to go to a bar oh. and play and listen to music and dance. Yeah. And, right. But we used to go to Tomorrowland. I see. In Disneyland. And uh -huh. we would hang out there, come in on our general admission tickets uh -huh. and meet all these girls from all over okay. the U.S. And, of course, they had tickets, and they would oh. invite us, well, why don't you go and write with us? And then, oh, how fun. Yeah. Oh, very creative. Yeah. Very creative. Yeah. <laughs> I get so, around. <laughs> yes, you do. I'm finding that out there. You get around. So were you ever a, you know, did you have a big uh, record collection that you had to carry with you, or were you not a big person that bought the LPs? And I did, I did, but back then there were four, 45s, I think they're called. Oh, yes, 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 yeah. with the little round yeah, yeah, circle yeah, the in the middle. Ones. Yeah, yeah, I had a gazillion of those. Oh, you know something? If you, I've got boxes, you know, the, remember the cases they were in? Right, yeah. I've got boxes of those 45s. Really? You should look at them sometime. Yeah. Because they are old, they're Eddie Fishers, and uh -huh. they're, you know. But well, just the cases? or the, the No, records? they're filled with oh, okay. 45s. Wow. Yeah, I do. I have them in storage someplace. Wow. They haven't melted. Who uh -huh. knows? <laughs> I owe, but, yeah, I, I could never find, because I, I no longer had the phonograph with the little yeah. doodad in the middle. So the, I never played them, and they're, you know, it, they were kind of bulky. So I put them in storage, and I've never found a collector that was interested in them. So, but there's priceless ones in there, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Brenda Lee, you know. Oh, yeah, oh my heavens Brenda sakes. Lee. Nobody sings her either. And my fool number one. Oh, or my fool number and even two. Connie Francis. Oh, yeah. You know, there were so many in, in that particular era. Teresa Brewer, I know I have her. Put another nickel in, in the Nickelodeon. Oh, my goodness sake, I used to love that one. Yeah. So, yeah, I've got a bunch. So, we will definitely get together and you can take a peek at those. If okay. you have a player, then that would be me more exciting. Uh, but You know, I don't know if, the, you know, they have these mock-up things that they sell nowadays. Mm -hmm. Like they have a radio and a CD player and a, right. and a record player. But I'm not sure if they do the, the 45s yeah. anymore. Yeah, because you'd have to find, I imagine if you Google it, you can maybe find somebody that sells that piece. Yeah, well, the do you have the regular? The player has to be able to slow down <gasps> because they that's have. That's right. They have, well, back then they had 78s. Yes. The big ones. And they ran on 78 RPMs, and then the the, the smaller ones well, ran on uh, 45. 45. And then you ended up getting to the 33, so that yeah. all of those were on there. Right. I wondered, again, Googling that, if somebody even had one of those old ones. Yeah. Some people just hang on to things, yeah. you know. But Well, because of all my moves, I just yes. know, get rid of my stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah. But again, and back in those days, you can afford to buy an album, Whereas today, and now I see them, a lot of them are now being sold, mm -hmm. you know, old um, Joni Mitchells or whatever, because the LPs are back now. People like the sound better and so yeah. on. So who knows what, what will happen. But so um, I thought about that as far as all your traveling, because you can only carry so much. And even if you're moving permanently to the U.S., unless you're taking trunks of stuff, mm -hmm. you're going to take the bare necessities. So. Right. So again, did, when you got to the states, then did you go to concert, or were you never a big concert goer? You know, I spent a lot of time going to school and studying, mm -hmm. and and you know, working, and mm -hmm. it was just part of my pattern, you know. Yeah, and that's kind of. I I, I did go uh, to when I was in high school. I went to see Jimi Hendrix at. Oh, at you did the, get to see yeah, him. <gasps> Anaheim uh, <sighs> Convention Center. In the flesh. Yeah. Did he play the guitar with his tongue? Yeah, yeah, actually. Wow. He, was, he excuse me. Um, he was uh, he was opening up for Eric Burden <gasps> and the Animals. Oh, for heaven's sake! So you got to see them. Yeah, yeah. Was that um, you in Anaheim? You said Anaheim yeah, Convention Anaheim, Center. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Yeah, 
I've seen a couple out at Pacific Amphitheater mm -hmm. um, where it's now the Orange County Fair, I think. That there used to be a Pacific Amphitheater called mm -hmm. there, and I saw Julio Iglesias there and yeah. Engelbert Humperdinck. Yeah. I saw a lot of bands throughout, you know, even in Germany, I saw uh, uh, Santana. Oh, for heaven's yeah. sakes. Yeah. <gasps> That's another yeah. and, guy uh, that rocks. Steppenwolf. Yeah. A couple oh. of other bands from England. So the crowds in Europe are just as crazy as the crowds here for oh, any yeah, concerts? Oh, yeah, it's the same thing. People go, back then, you know, people would go and, and smoke dope, and, and then they light their lighters, and you see the whole, you know, oh, the yes. whole stadium. Instead of, instead of lighting candles, they'd have their lighters. And now they use their phones, right? Right, exactly. They put the yeah. phone on yeah. to do the same thing. Yeah, I'm surprised kind of when you, um, and this is not a very nice thing to say, I guess, but... Um, the fact that you were so studious and that you weren't a big party guy. Um, that yeah, sometimes you think of musicians that just party all no, the time. No, and no, no, no. A lot of musicians, we like to play music, but we don't know what to do with ourselves when we're at a party. Because ah. we're always used to, you know. You got to have something in your hands. Right, exactly. Yeah. You know, and so, so, you know, the small talk and the partying, I had to really learn. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't something that I did naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not a small talker i like to have conversations but just to talk for the sake of talking as you said is kind of take it or leave it but yeah it's business meetings are like that yeah you know i mean when you meet for a christmas party at the at the you know the company's you know yes uh, christmas party or something mm -hmm. you, that's that's the place where where people do small talk it's yes like you have to be able to walk up to to a colleague or to a total stranger who is from another uh, brand. division, yeah, yeah division. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I remember once watching um, Johnny Mathis on Johnny Carson, and he was just so nervous. And Johnny said, "Are, are you nervous?" He says, "Yeah, this isn't comfortable. Can I sing?" <laughs> and he got up, and of course, that's yeah. like, and so it was his instrument, and that he felt much more playing, if you will, his voice mm -hmm. than sitting and making small talk. Right. That was, he was not good at that. So you said that uh, you, st you spent about 20 years up in Oregon, and that's when you met Nancy? Yeah. Your current wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we met at the <coughs> health club. We were playing racquetball back then. Oh, yeah, racquetball was then. Now it's pickleball. Yeah. So, yeah. But racquetball was really big. And did you stay up there after you were married for a while? Yeah, we lived there for, like I said, 30. Well, I lived there for 34 years. Nancy uh -huh. came in the last, like, five or ten years after uh -huh. that. It's, it was a long time. Okay. And then the kids, uh, her her daughter and their family moved to California. Mm. So we really didn't have anybody left up there, you know, but ah. friends and all that. And yeah. So we said, well, you know, we should try California and see what, you know, what mm -hmm. that's like. So we came down here and found this place, Laguna Woods. And so you came directly it. here? Yeah, we looked around. And we weren't just going to move some in some neighborhood right. here. And so we found this place, and we look. We went on the bus tour. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. Had the docent walk you around the whole thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we really liked it. It was, mm -hmm. it was very, uh, you know, up, up, up our alley. Yes, yeah. yeah. And so by that time, you were retired, of course. Right. You absolutely. were no longer doing that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, once you moved in here, which year about was that? Do you know? In uh, well, six years ago. Oh, okay. That is, you know. Yeah. So you haven't been here all that long. No. Uh, and I think you said something about you realized how much you guys enjoyed it here and, and thought you were in Shangri-La, and so you joined every club. Yeah, yeah. And, and then found out that's a little bit over, overdoing right, it. Right, right. <laughs> we were just busy from morning until uh, nighttime. And, yeah. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good advertisement for people that say, well, I want to go someplace, even though I'm retired, I want to have things to do. Mm -hmm. There's a thousand things to do here, yeah. and you found that out. But, you know, like along with all that stuff, I missed the music. Because mm, yes. up in Oregon, I was playing like three or four times a week. <gasps> I was oh. uh, playing a, a, either at a club or I was, you know, doing a session with, with other musicians. 
Was it difficult to get gigs uh, up in Oregon? Yeah. Well, once you're in the circuit, once you, once okay. you played the Eagles or the Elks or whatever, they mm -hmm. keep hiring you back. And then that's when you were a small band. It wasn't just you, or was it wasn't just you. No, then? it was like a four-piece. Okay, yeah. four-piece band. Yeah. So then you get, as you said, on the circuit. Yeah. Um, and once you moved in here and got involved with different uh, clubs and so on, then how, I, I remember um, hearing you at what was, I guess, called a, a jam then, mm -hmm. um, put on by um, Dan, and uh, he had it over at Clubhouse 6. And you could bring your own everything, and mm -hmm. then they had different member, band members and singers and so on that just kind of came in and mm -hmm. sat down and played. And um, I remember hearing you play then, and you played the bass. Mm -hmm. and it, I just was blown away. I thought, wow, this guy is really good. And, and of course, again, I hadn't been to that many musical, you know, uh, dances or anything here. And also sitting up so close to really hear you and not on a stage mm -hmm. somewhere. So I remembered. And then later on, Dan Hobby, was, he was also, uh, I think, became a friend of yours. He played guitar a little bit then, too. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that he was ever in a band. And then... He told me about the fact that you were doing this at Clubhouse 3. Mm -hmm. and, and that was kind of like a jam, where people could come that played instruments or sang. Right, yeah. When I first got here, um, like I said, I missed playing music, and I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I went to, uh, to recreation, and I, mm -hmm. I just rented a room, and I passed out these flyers that they do. and. Mm -hmm. uh, so I put together a jam just to see how many other musicians mm -hmm. there are in the village, and how, and that's how I met Lyle and and Ron Gagnon. Mm -hmm. We used to play together in the, well we called it the Dutch of Fizz, and then if we played other gigs that Ron got, if he signed the contract, we called it the Rock of Ages. So oh okay, so, so you were there at the beginning yeah, when yeah. that was formed. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. So we we and we played at the uh, the Orange County. Uh, Fairgrounds. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah, we went around and mm -hmm. knuckleheads and. Uh, <laughs> That's where you'd play was at knuckleheads and yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was pretty tight stage. Oh. There. Yeah. I do, I th I remember that was the first time also I heard Jeff Sinclair sing at your jam session there at uh -huh. Clubhouse Three, and I think he does. Yeah, I met Jeff walking down the street. He was, he was, close to a Clubhouse Four, and I. He was, I don't know what he was doing, he was just walking, and I, I saw him, and I saw the long hair, and I said, <laughs> I said, hey, are you a musician? And he said, no, I'm a vocalist. Oh. And I said, well, I tell you what, I'm going to have a, a jam session mm -hmm. next week in Clubhouse 3, why don't you come by and, uh, mm -hmm. and see what we can do. Maybe you want to sit in and sing yeah. a song. And, it, and again, it becomes a tight community where like when you know one, then you get to know the other, and yeah. so it's again, it's like that grapevine. Everybody knows everybody else. Yeah. So, um, and I know you'd said that you really, you know, at one point you had uh, we'd form bands, but that you really preferred to just sit in. Now that it's a lot of work to keep, you know, a band together. And yeah, I don't have that infrastructure where I have people helping me with the gear and people helping oh. me with the advertisements and what have you, you know, the setting up the stage. And, you know, that's why I play in a three-piece. With Most of the time, I don't even have a drummer. It's just okay. bass, drums, guitar. Okay, yeah. And so, you know, it makes it so much easier. Right. And, you know, you don't have to haul as much gear. You don't, you know, you call up three guys and say, hey, can you make this date? And if they say yes. You got a yeah. gig. Yeah. Except for when we play at places like the American Legion, mm -hmm. because they require a drummer there. Okay. Then we just hire a drummer to mm -hmm. sit in with us and uh, play. Yeah. Do you spend a lot of time? Well, as you said before, it's not really difficult, especially with the, the blues, that they just don't need a rehearse. They just synchronize yeah. quickly. What about when you do like rock and roll and play uh, we, gigs here? We, do you We take rehearse? my set list and just learn it. I mean, uh, most individually. Of, most guys that I've played with, they're so professional. I don't yeah. even have to teach them mm -hmm. my songs. They already know them. It's, yeah. And we might get together for one night, and we go through the song lists mm -hmm. and uh, pick out the songs mm -hmm. we need to work on, and, and yeah. then we play the gig. Yeah. 
and, and that sounds so, to me, that is what you would expect, kind of, is that when you've been a musician as long as you have, that you can pick up almost anything, right, real quickly, as you did when we said, oh, here's our playlist, you know, can you be there in, in six hours or whatever yeah. it was that we gave you, that uh, we, we had a COVID issue, so we had to fill in, and you were so good at doing that. But again, I think that that was... Uh, I wasn't concerned because I know that you're a musician that you could fill in. But do you still enjoy the gigs that you do here yeah, I in, do. I really in the village? <clears throat> Excuse me. At the moment, I'm, I'm sitting in and I'm playing with the Nomads a lot. You know? Okay. And, and there again, you know, it's, it depends on sometimes, you know, some of our musicians are moving around between bands. So if I'm available for a certain gig, I'll, I'll, I'll play or uh -huh. I, I have to tell them, no, I can't make it because I've got another engagement. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I really enjoy, you know, having just be, you know, having to just show up with my gear, plopping it down and just playing the gig and not mm -hmm. having to worry about all the management mm -hmm. uh, behind all the yeah. scenes. The thing that, um, again, just, you know, like you said, your guitar is basically all you need to carry and not a lot of equipment. Um, but again, something because of your uh, knowledge and your experience. Another thing that really helped us out was that you knew how to do the PA system. Mm -hmm. So that having that knowledge, even though you know you're not going to do it every gig, but the fact that you were able to do that to me, again, your experience doesn't go to waste because you, I know how to do that. I can fix that or whatever, mm -hmm. and that was real, real helpful. But um, and I, it is becoming, you know, I'm running into more and more musicians here in the village that I don't know if they've been hiding under a rock or if just COVID just brought everything out and with Passive Park that people started coming out just because people were so tired of sitting locked in their houses. And also, uh, that's one thing I've always found here in the village, the activity of the people here, the dances are so well attended, which keeps them active. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not playing tennis or uh, golf or whatever it is, you're pretty much going to go to dances. Right. And they have, an, they used to, of course, they used to mm -hmm. have enough of them. And now we're hopefully going to start doing that again, yeah. opening up things. And I know it's been difficult for uh, the rec department, you know, when we call and say, how come seven isn't open yet? Or how come they said, yeah. we don't have employees. Yeah. Nobody's, we can't, nobody is wanting to be hired. We got the, you know, the job offers out there but nobody's signing up for it so that's and I said well can't we help and he said well sure you could volunteer but when you're at a rec in one of the rec department to help you have to lift chairs and tables and do setups yeah so that's where the seniors pretty much can't help right exactly as a volunteer that's why we started playing in the park like yeah the park was you know way back then I when it was still a bowling place oh the lawn, lawn bowling. bowling yeah the lawn bowl yeah I was talking to William and I said you know that place is just sitting there and it, it we're not, you know it's not being used can, can you guys do something like make it into a park so that we could play there <laughs> oh how nice yeah and, and William said well we're working on it and okay. and then of course it took about a year to tear it down then another uh -huh. year to to put grass in uh -huh. and all that and and I asked him back then I said well can I rent the place to to, to have an outside concert. Yeah. And he said, well, no, because, you know, we're not really set up for that. But he said, you can do it uh, uh, low, low key yeah. wise. I mean, just as long as you don't announce it to the whole world, mm -hmm. you know, you can go there and just play if you want to. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we started doing. Yeah. We started playing. Then club. you were fighting for slots as to when we were, you could play there because everybody was booked. Exactly. You know, they had a regu regular schedule yeah. to do that. What I'm pre impressed with, though, is, and we probably need to do more of that, is go to whoever, whether it's rec department, because that's what you wanted to do, but coming up with a creative idea and them saying, ah, yeah, that could, you know, I think that, I mean, sometimes we come up with harebrained ideas and nobody's going to buy that, but that, as you said, was it was a wasted space. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. space. Yeah. Um, you can see the mountains from there, and of course the pool's right next door. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's a really wonderful place to play. So he took you up on it. Just took a little while to to come to fruition. But well, yeah, actually, we never he never he never did clear it with with uh, 
GRF because they were closed because of oh, COVID. Yeah. And we wanted to play, so we just said, well, what are they going to do, kick us out? You know. Yeah. And, of course, that never happened. No. So we just continued the outdoor concerts, and yeah. we're still doing it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people are enjoying it. Mm -hmm. We have a very good turnout. Mm -hmm. uh, so in case people don't know where Passive Park is, it's uh, right next to Clubhouse 2 on the right side when you're mm -hmm. facing the clubhouse, yeah. right next to the swimming pool. There. Well, when you look at that, think about that, too. Is, and I knew they used to do it by the creek. I never did go down to the creek, uh, but where they started performing outdoors. But again, it was that hunger for music mm -hmm. that people and just getting out and they felt safe because you could keep social distancing too. the connection was connection, there yeah. and yet you didn't need to be farther you know you could keep your distance mm -hmm. so people felt oh, i can go to that and keep my yeah keep my distance we had some interesting things happening there like people uh, there were those who played music there were those who liked to listen to music mm -hmm. and there were those who didn't like the music or anything about it and and i remember one time we were there and this this woman was there and she decided to demonstrate against the music. Oh. And she had these air blasters with her <gasps> and she had a music boom box and she was making as much noise as she could and she was telling us she was protesting. Oh. And so so then security came and they asked her, Well, you know, can you just maybe move over a, a little further and do it over there and and it was uh, it was interesting. Yes, yeah. people. Uh, yeah, because I, I did read occasionally in the Globe about that some of the neighbors, you know, said it was too loud or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. again, close a window, you know, it do whatever. Right. Because why we can't, you know, yeah. it's not all about me. It's right. about what's good for the group. Exactly, the village yeah. and mm -hmm. and people were so hungry for that. I oh, mean, there were people that sat in their houses for a year. They haven't been anywhere. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah. they were so excited about it. I think that's why it's exciting right now. Um, Carmen was saying that in the Globe today, there's just, it's chock full of activities. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody is just so ready to get out and about and get things back going like they were that it, it just seems like it's a burst of energy, which Lord knows it's time, yeah. you know. We're definitely tired of all that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're, you know, finding places to to a play but and that, that it's enough because you can pick and choose when you want to play and when you don't mm -hmm. uh, because you just sit in you're not calling the shots and right. there's, there's yeah. a good part of that oh there is yeah, yeah. so but great. I still like to play my music so once in a while but you know like right now I you know I play at uh, at the American Legion in, in Newport okay I got a couple of contracts there but you know if I don't do anything special, I still like the Passive Park where we just play and, uh, for tips and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm planning this blues jam. Yes. I still have to think about how I'm going to go about it because, you know, it's mostly for the people in the village. Uh -huh. So I don't want people from, you know, maybe one or two people to be invited from the outside, but I don't want a whole outside influx coming there and mm -hmm. filling up. Well, that's an interesting thought because of, the, of your experience with the, following the, the blues in Huntington yeah. and uh, different places that to be able to invite the musicians mm -hmm. but not their followers because you don't really need their followers. And that would be, I think, would cause too many. But to have right. people um, that are not used to really good blues, like you said that you would go to these, that might be an interesting thought is yeah. to have them come. But say you know it's you got to go through the gate, so we're just going to have exactly. The musicians. Yeah, there's a lot of risk involved in bringing other people from the outside. Yeah, in. if you just did the musicians, you right. know what they're going to do. But that would be kind of fun because then you guys could really, you know, go back to the days when you would just be able to play together, and it would be really, really a blues yeah. jam session, yeah. as you people, said. People like. We all could use the blues right now. I think we, yes. we lived through a lot of stuff, and I oh. think people can really identify. Speaking of that, because do you write any music at all? I have, I have, but I never really played you know, it. Yeah, I, I I did recordings, but I didn't. Oh, uh, were you? What did you lean toward? Rock and roll, country? It was more a rock and roll. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you like the lyric part or the 
actual music part? Or I'm, I'm more a musician, so it's mm -hmm. more it's more about the music. Like so if somebody was good with lyrics and said, can you make a tune out of this, here's the words, uh -huh. then that's a possibility? Yes, I have, I have tried that. Oh, okay, put yeah. something together. What I get a kick out of is that of so many country songs written by guys that could never say those words out loud to somebody, but they can sing them, you know, and they wrote it. And that's why the blues <laughs> is so good, because, you know, you can almost rap the blues. Oh. You know, you can get, and, and so instead of, you don't really have to be a musician, but you have, do have to be a vocalist. So you can go up there and you can tell your entire story. Oh, and, yes. And be heard and have people uh, identified with you. Mm -hmm. and well, you know, because I, I, I guess I like Willie Nelson, but I wouldn't call him a vocalist. Mm -hmm. And same with Chris Christopherson. And of course, when they did the Highwaymen together with Waylon Jennings and Johnny Cash and that, I mean, that was, if, you're, if I'd ever been able to go to that concert. But I still think of Chris Christopherson as more of a talker and a storyteller than an actual singer, mm -hmm. a, a vocalist. Um, and even with, with Willie. But I would think that that's, and again, like you said, right now is probably a good time to start playing the blues and, and bringing the blues in because people can sing about what it's been like to yeah, be locked up. Yeah, people have been locked, locked up, up so long and mm -hmm. they haven't had anybody to listen to their story. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And, you know, they're, yes. they're just so excited to be able mm -hmm. to reconnect with other people. Again. Right. Well, keep up and let me know how you're doing on that. If there's anything I can do to help you PR that once you get more things yeah. in line as to what you want to do and where and when and all that. I had, well, I, I send out a, a flyer that uh, a lot of people have responded to. They said, yeah, I would oh, like yeah? to play the booze. And then, you know, I've, I've had these experiences where they said, yeah, well, can I bring my whole band? And I go, that's you know, not that's what that's you're not, doing. No, that's not what I want to do. It's, it's, I want to have like a back line of musicians mm -hmm. and then have two or three musicians come in and, and play along with that back line. Yes. Like yeah. maybe a harmonica player mm -hmm. or a saxophone player. Mm -hmm. and. If somebody plays bass, yes, we could replace the bass player with somebody yeah. else, but not not the whole no. band. Yeah, that would say. not, to me, be, that's not what I would call a jam session. A jam session is multiple musicians right, exactly. rotating right, and so on. Right. Well, I sure hope that works for you. Yeah, yeah, I hope so, too. I think mm -hmm. it'll be gr a great asset to the village. And Yes. I've always been, you know, I've done so much commercial stuff, and, and I've played commercially and I've played professionally, that... I'm I'm not really all that interested in, in mm -hmm. being the commercial guy, yeah. you know. I much rather play, you know, in the park and uh -huh. have a good time and and feel feel confident yeah. that that you know nothing is going to get, you know, uh, ruined or right. whatever. But again, it sounds like what you want to do is just go play and have fun. Right. Because right. at our age, we should be just looking forward to just having a good time and laughing. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> all right. Thanks. Oh, another close? Yeah, all right, yeah. Oh, let me get my nose in. All right. Again, I cannot thank you enough. It's been enjoyable. It's, it's gone by so fast. But I really, really like some of your ideas that you're pushing forward now as far as the, the blues jam session. That would be so unique and different. Mm -hmm. And we, we do have a lot of musicians here and I am so thankful that you were one of them that I was able to interview and find out who you were, first of all, before you became the musician. So I really, really appreciate your coming here today. It's been a good time for me. Well, thank you for having me here. Yeah. And, and I will hope to see you on the next stage. If, you know, I yes. Mean, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to be on the stage, but you'll, you'll be in front of it. And you'll yes. be enjoying the scene with the rest of us. Oh, I hope to. Hope to. Thanks. Thank you.